evolutionists use what they call the geological column as evidence that the Earth is ancient, each layer corresponding to millions of years. In a stunning example of circular reasoning, they date these layers by the fossils they contain, and they date the fossils by the layers they're in. Unfortunately for them, there is no geological column. There is no place on Earth where this supposed geological column exists other than in evolutionary textbooks. On top of this, while evolutionists often criticize creationists for having no model which makes any sort of scientific prediction, this is just one case where they couldn't be more wrong. In fact, flood geology predicts quite well how stratification can happen due to hydrological sorting. Wow. Two theories on the stratification of the Earth. Are they both testable? Do either of them make accurate predictions? I decided to investigate. Occam's razor states that among competing hypotheses, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. To select the evolutionary theory, one must assume, among other things, uniformitarianism, plate tectonics, continental drift, and the assertion of billions of years for natural forces to account for all that we see in the geological record. Flood geology, on the other hand, only requires the assumption of a worldwide flood. It doesn't even require the assumption of God. Obviously, the winner here is flood geology. Flood geology easily explains and even predicts stratification via hydrological sorting. During a flood, large amounts of dirt and sediment get swept up. In the case of a flood on a global scale, the amount of Earth's swept up must be proportionally greater. When sediment is swept up by water, it remains suspended for some amount of time before it slowly precipitates downward to the bottom. At first, the sediments will be uniformly suspended, but will slowly precipitate at the bottom in very distinct layers. This happens because certain sediments are heavier than others, and therefore settle faster. The first sediments to settle will be heavier items like rocks followed by pebbles. The finer grains will remain suspended a bit longer. In the end, the sediment will all settle to the bottom in order from heaviest to lightest. If the supposed geological column showed a distribution of sediments from heavy to light, that would be slam dunk evidence for a global flood. As it happens, this is not what we see. In fact, the weight distribution in the layers alternates wildly from layer to layer. There are even large boulders commonly called erratics or drop stones which appear throughout the strata. Compounding this, there are even layers interspersed throughout which are made of material that forms under dry, arid conditions like hypersolvus and subsolvus granites, calcretes, and caliche, as well as material that requires a long period of evaporation like salt, travertine, and evaporites. Finally, we also find layers running perpendicular to each other. A worldwide flood may require only one assumption, but it doesn't explain the distribution and variance of stratigraphy in the Earth. Of course, that doesn't mean that the old Earth hypothesis wins by default. It must stand on its own merits. Let's see how well it does. The origin of the Old Earth Hypothesis begins with uniformitarianism proposed by James Hutton in 1785. The prevailing theory of his day was the theory of catastrophism, which proposed that the geological features of the Earth and the history of life are explained by sudden catastrophic events that had caused the extinction of many species. Hutton recognized geological processes at work and realized that the Earth was perpetually being formed and reshaped. From there, he reasoned that the history of the Earth could be determined by understanding how processes processes such as erosion and sedimentation work in the present day. The assumption that the same geological processes that operate in the present have always operated came to be known as uniformitarianism. Hutton noticed the deposition rates for sediments and erosion. He noted characteristics in granites which indicated it had once been molten, but was protruding metamorphic schist indicating that the metamorphic schist must have formed previous to the granite. He recognized unconformities in the strata resulting from obvious erosion and in some cases even breaking and resulting in subsequent strata running perpendicular. He also saw that there were also spans of time where there was no deposition, a period known as a hiatus. Hutton realized that a single catastrophe like a flood or earthquake couldn't account for any of this, but that a series of geological events could account for all of it. A close friend 
friend, John Playfair, mused that Hutton was among the first to notice that a vast proportion of the present rocks are composed of materials afforded by the destruction of bodies, animal, vegetable, and mineral, of more ancient formation. Hutton's ideas were hotly debated at first, being in direct opposition to catastrophism. Between 1830 and 1833, Charles Lyell published the first of his three-volume tome with a lengthy title, Principles of Geology Being an Attempt to Explain the Former Changes of the Earth's Surface by Reference to Causes Now in Operation. Principles of Geology Built Upon Hutton's Uniformitarianism Theories Lyell looked to earthquakes as a creative force, noting the results of then-recent earthquakes causing surface irregularities such such as faults, fissures, stratigraphic displacements, and depressions. He also noticed the frequency of certain types of fossils in tertiary layers. Based on the type, frequency, and proportion of fossils, he renamed the tertiary period layers the Cenozoic Era and separated it into epochs called Pliocene, Miocene, and Eocene. After Lyell and many other scientists observed that certain fossils only appear in particular layers, these fossils became known as index fossils. Although index fossils couldn't be used to absolutely date anything, they did offer a practical starting point for the dating methods to come. Lyell also noticed erratic stones and boulders which showed no geological context, obviously having come from someplace else, and he deduced that glaciers were the only known natural force which could relocate such large bodies. Since glaciers in the northern hemisphere generally flow south, this proposition necessarily predicted the later confirmed fact that the sources for these erratics would be found closer to the poles. Lyle would continue to study geological anomalies and continue to revise his theories over the 12 subsequent editions of Principles of Geology. Eventually, he calculated, due to the rates of the natural forces he studied, a minimum age of 300 million years for Earth. Contrary to creationist claims, there are several places around the world where strata from all geological eras do exist in a single area. For example, you can view the entire column in the Bonaparte Basin in Australia and the Williston Basin in North Dakota. It can be quite fascinating to realize that every strata of different material represents a time when the climate and topography were vastly different. These serve as reminders that change is the rule, not the exception. Lyle's calculated age was based on knowledge of many geological processes. He simply calculated the minimum amount of time required for each type of layer he saw and combined those individual figures. While he was accurate in extrapolating the minimum time required for each layer, he was completely unaware of another as yet unknown force of nature. We will investigate this force in the next episode, Evolutionist Dating Methods Part 2, which builds on the discoveries investigated here. Lyle and Hutton offered a much more consistent explanation for the geological column than a single worldwide flood. It wasn't completely accurate but it was at least testable and, to some degree, observable. All good theories are testable. Most good theories go through a good amount of revision to more accurately fit observation. This is a continuous process and another example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.